he had already written the play. When we come to chapter 11, and Ransom's thinking, this isn't fair, why am I here? And we're told at the end of the second paragraph, he could not understand why Malodil should remain absent when the enemy was there in person. Where's God? He knew that Malodil was not absent, however, because when he had, has that thought, he immediately senses Malodil's presence. That sense, so very welcome yet never welcomed without the overcoming of a certain resistance, that sense of the presence which he had once or twice before experienced on Paralandra returned to him. The darkness was packed quite full. Moreover, he became aware in some indefinable fashion that it had never been absent, that only some unconscious activity of his own had succeeded in ignoring it for the past few days. And then Ransom thinks, oh, fine, it's all very well, a presence of that sort, but the enemy is really here. Satan is really there in the body of Weston. Really saying and doing things. Where is Malodil's representative? And suddenly, it's like Ransom gets smacked upside the head. What can I do? His self asks. I've done all I can. I've talked till I'm sick of it. It's no good, I tell you. He tried to per persuade himself that he, Ransom, and not possibly Melodil's representative, as the unman was the representative of L. In other words, as the unman is the incarnation, so to speak, of hell on Paralandra, Ransom is the incarnation of heaven on Paralandra. He was horrified when the darkness simply flung back this argument in his face, almost impatiently. And then he wondered how it had escaped him till now. He was forced to perceive that his own coming to Paralandra was at least as much of a marvel as the enemy's. After all, Weston arrived in Paralandra on a spaceship. How did Ransom arrive? In a flying magical coffin. Ransom, himself, right in the middle of 141, was the miracle. He says, well, this is crazy. This is nonsense. Very well, then. He'd been brought here miraculously. He was in God's hands. As long as he did his best, and he had done his best, God would see to the final issue. He had not succeeded, but he'd done his best. No one could do more. That's all God really wants. Just do your best and God will do the rest. Okay? And as he's thinking this, we're told, very last sentence, it snapped like a violin string. Not one rag of all this evasion was left. Relentlessly, unmistakably, the darkness pressed down upon him the knowledge that this picture of the situation was utterly false. If the issue lay in Malodil's hands, Ransom and the lady were those hands. The fate of a world really depended on how they behaved in the next few hours. The thing was irreducibly, nakedly real. In other words, Ransom can't just throw up his hands and say, oh, I've done my best. He is being told, no, you haven't done your best. There's still more to do. They could, if they chose, decline to save the innocence of this new race. And if they declined, its innocence would not be saved. It rested with no other creature in all time or space. And so he thinks, why is God doing this? What was the sense of so arranging things? that anything really important should finally and absolutely depend on such a man of straw as himself. That's the question of the Garden of Eden. Why did God so arrange things and then say, you can eat whatever you want, 
But of this one tree, don't touch it. And at that moment, far away on earth, as he now could not help remembering, men were at war, and white-faced subalterns and freckled corporals, who had but lately begun to shave, stood in horrible gaps, or crawled forward in deadly darkness, awaking like him to the preposterous truth that all really depended on their actions. In other words, Lewis is saying, every day, every moment of our lives, we are in the exact same position. Does the world fall anew because of our actions? Do we repeat what the Orthodox Church calls the ancestral sin? not original sin. The sin of our ancestors, our first ancestors. Do we repeat it all over again and make the world fall all over again? In Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, there's a, a, a Russian elder, the star it's Zosima, and he explains in, in a passage that every sin committed by every individual reverberates beyond that individual. Like dropping a, a stone in a pond creates ripples that go out all the way to the edge of the pond. Every sin we commit creates ripples in time and space and they go out from us in every sin not just a sin that involves another person not just a murder but a sin of thought a sin of commission as well as omission reverberates out and affects all of reality affects not only people but affects plants affects animals, affects the natural environment, everything. And in that sense, every sin, every act of disobedience, because that's what sin is, every act of disobedience recreates the fall all over again. Ransom goes on. He's talked about the subaltern and the corporal. And far away in time, Horatius stood on the bridge, and Constantine settled in his mind whether he would or would not embrace the new religion. And Eve herself stood looking upon the forbidden fruit, and the heaven of heavens waited for her decision. The serpent speaks to her, and Eve reaches out, and all heaven is silent, watching her, waiting for what she will do. And Ransom sits there. We're told he writhes and grinds his teeth. Why? He doesn't like being here. Why me, God? Is essentially what he's doing. Thus and not otherwise the world was made. In other words, as Gandalf says, it doesn't do any good to ask those questions. That is a what might have been. This is what is. We can only deal with what is. Thus and not otherwise the world was made. Either something or nothing must depend on individual choices. Something what does he really mean? Everything depends on individual choices. A stone may determine the course of a river. He was that stone at this horrible moment which had become the center of the whole universe. The odilla of all worlds, the sinless organisms of everlasting light, were silent in deep heaven to see what Elwin Ransom Cambridge would do. Notice his first name, Elwin. 
means friend of angels. Friend of angels. And Ransom just sits there thinking. In the middle of 143, it stood to reason that a struggle with the devil meant a spiritual struggle. The notion of a physical combat was only fit for a savage. After all, what does St. Paul say in Ephesians? We wage war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, thrones, dominions, etc. So, almost as soon as he has that thought, it gets thrown back in his face. Bottom of 143. Ransom decreed that whatever the silence and the darkness seemed to be saying about this, no such crude materialist struggle could possibly be what Maladil really intended. No, no, no. It has to be an intellectual discussion. After all, he's a professor. He's not a pugilist. He's not a boxer. It has to be a moral struggle. How did Christ defeat Satan? Crucified on the cross. That's how. Crucified on the cross. It was physical. It was flesh and blood. It would degrade the spiritual warfare to the condition of, beautiful phrase here, mere mythology. Because the myths are full of stories of God's physical interactions with humans. That's lowercase God's plural. But here he got another check. Okay, Keep in mind, what did he just think? It would degrade the spiritual warfare to the condition of mere mythology. But what does he already learn about mythology? What is mythology on earth, on earth might be reality elsewhere. But here he got another check. Long since on Mars, and more strongly since he came to Paralandra, Ransom had been perceiving that the triple distinction of truth from myth and of both from fact was purely terrestrial. It was part and parcel of that unhappy division between soul and body which resulted from the fall. Even on earth, the sacraments existed as a permanent reminder that the divide was neither wholesome nor final. The incarnation had been the beginning of its disappearance. In Paralandra, it would have no meaning at all. Whatever happened here would be of such a nature that earthmen would call it mythological. Now notice that phrase. The triple distinction of truth from myth and of both from fact. He says, that is an earthly invention. Outside the bounds of earth, in other words, in eternity, in heaven, in God's mind, truth, myth, and fact, they're the same thing. There is no distinction. Myth is true. And myth is fact. Fact is truth. Truth is myth. Get what he's saying there. And he says the sacraments are instituted by God, instituted by the church, to bridge the divisions between them. Well, what are the sacraments? You've got the sacrament of marriage. You've got the sacrament of baptism. You've got the sacrament of the communion meal. You've got the sacrament of taking holy orders, becoming a, a priest in the church. You've got the sacrament of last rites. Okay? The church institutes seven sacraments. bottom of that same page. <laughs> Ransom's still trying to reason a way out of what he knows he has to do. In the bottom of 144, it's as if the darkness says to him, you know you're only wasting time. Every minute it became clearer to him that the parallel he had tried to draw between Eden and Paralandra was crude and imperfect. Why? What had happened on earth 
When Malodil was born a man, 